Hello, I am Nolan Dalla. This is NFL week number three. And this is Alex, my baby. He's a 13-year-old half Maine Coon. He's a stray. We adopted him from a shelter, and he's been part of the family for 13 years. Right, Alex? He's from Washington, D.C. That's where we got him from 13 years ago, and he's our baby. Anyway, Alex, we're going to let you run off and, and uh, chase some mice and do whatever you, you do at night, okay? All right, Alex. Anyway, I'm here to talk about NFL Week 3. This is the first time I've done anything like this. As you know, I do a lot of videos, and I um, have yet to do anything about NFL handicapping on video, but I'm going to start doing it hopefully every week, as long as I have the energy and money <laughs> and wine. By the way, today's uh, uh, video is, is, is brought to you by an Argentine Malbec, one of my favorite wines. And this is Septimina. It's a really, really excellent um, full-bodied Malbec from Argentina. So to you and to victory and to winning in NFL week number three. Now NFL week number two, I just assume forget it, but I won't. I'm not going to hide from anything. I'm not going to say, oh, let's just forget about that. Let's brush it under the rug because that's not what I do. It's about honesty. It's about integrity. It's about showing the wins and the losses and the misery and the humiliation that goes with NFL betting and sports betting because that's really what it is. And last week I went three wins and 11 losses. Three wins and 11 losses. Try to top that. Try to beat that. See if you can beat that. Lost about $4,000 betting on NFL football, one of my worst weeks ever. So I said to myself, while the rest of the world is off licking their wounds, while the rest of the world is crying over all of their losses, while the rest of the world is pretending the misery didn't happen, Nolan Dalla looks straight into the camera and says, this is what happened. I went 3 and 11. It was painful. It was rough. It was expensive. Anyway, let's get back to the NFL. Week number three. Brand new week. Brand new bankroll. Still got lots of money left to fire. And let's see if we can roll a few sevens. There's 14 games in the NFL this week. Uh, Ten are played in the early uh, the, the early games. Then there's three later games plus a Sunday night and a Monday night game. I'm giving you this report uh, on, on Friday night. The Tampa Bay Atlanta game was last night, so it's already been played. Let's look at how handicapping goes and what we look at when we examine uh, NFL wagers. The first game on the board is San Diego is playing at Buffalo. Now Buffalo is laying minus one in this game. This is a wonderful spot for the Buffalo Bills and a horrible spot for the San Diego Chargers who are the dog. Why? Well San Diego is coming off a, uh, a remarkable performance, their best game in probably a couple of years, where they beat the defending Super Bowl champion Seattle Seahawks at home. A huge victory, confidence builder for the Chargers. Now they have to somehow we bottle that enthusiasm and go on the road through three time zones and go into Buffalo, New York and win there on the road. I don't think it's happening. Buffalo is 2-0 and right now, laying only a point. That's a very generous line. This line probably, in my view, should be at least at, at least 2.5 and, and probably 3. And that's because these are two, in my view, very closely matched teams. I think Buffalo may be for real. This may be a 500 team. This may be a playoff contender winning on the road in week one. In Chicago, and then that's not an easy thing to do. And then coming back and playing and just demolishing Miami in week number two. San Diego could be 2-0 as well, but they're 1-1. One one. They're going in into a horrible spot. Give me the Buffalo Bills, minus one. I think there's a value all over that wager. Buffalo Bills, minus one. Dallas Cowboys are going into St. Louis, and Dallas is a surprising 1-1 one one after a horrible opening against San Francisco. They go into Tennessee last week. And win, I think, 26-10 was a final. A, a shocking final score because I think everyone had given up entirely on the Dallas defense. And the Dallas defense played their best game in, I don't know, a couple of years. Uh, and, and, and Tennessee just, just stank. Now, Dallas has to now go on the road for the second straight year, uh, week. I always like fading teams that have to go on the road two straight weeks in the NFL. For whatever reason, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to regurgitate your game plan after a road win or loss, it doesn't matter, but you've got to go back on a plane and play in a hostile environment once again. Now, St. Louis, not the most hostile environment, not the best team. That is a 7-9 squad from last year. It's also a Jeff Fisher coach team with a very good...
good front four. And I think that's the key to this game. Dallas's offense has played very well, especially running the ball. I, I, let me stand corrected. Dallas's rushing game has played very well this season, not the offense so much. They've run the ball uh, in both games very, very well. And now the problem is that happens to be the Rams' strength, which is their front defensive four. Rams' pretty good defense, expected to be above average this season. A 7-9 team, get it as a dog. Uh, they absolutely were humiliated in their home uh, opener, the Rams were, against Minnesota. I think this is a spot for redemption, a chance to get to 2-1, and one, a chance to have a winning record with a well-coached team. This is a rally around the, the, the hill as the backup quarterback, playing against a defense that's not very good, which is the Cowboys. Also, an offense that really is like patchwork, has a lot of problems on the offensive line. I think the Rams win this one outright as the dog. I will go over... Uh, uh, over the total of 45 and a half, and I will also uh, play the dog Rams in this game. Washington Redskins are playing at Philadelphia. The, Reds, the, the Redskins uh, Eagles rivalry goes back to the 1930s or something, and the Eagles are laying seven here. And that's a really interesting line because the Eagles have been behind by double digits in both of their games so far. They were down 17 nothing in the home opener against Jacksonville. Somehow came back and won by two touchdowns. And then they go in Indianapolis on Monday Night Football. On Monday Night Football. They're down by 11. I think it was 17-6. to 6. The Eagles somehow storm back and win that game by 3. 30-27. to 27. Now That's really impressive in some ways. But you could also say the, the Eagles could be 0-2 right now. Um, the Eagles don't win, don't seem to win pretty. They, I know winning ugly, that's uh, kind of a crazy thing to say. But I, I think this is one of those spots where the Redskins are probably worth our money. And here's why. Here's why. The Redskins looked like a horrible team when they opened up at Houston, and then they didn't look good in the first quarter until Griffin goes down. And then all of a sudden the quarterback comes in, the backup, which is Cousins, who a lot of people that really watch the Redskins and know this team think that Cousins might be the better fit or the better quarterback for this team at this time. I'm not saying he's the better quarterback than Griffin. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying there's something about the gel and the chemistry of teams and the confidence that maybe Cousins comes in with his system, seems to comes in last week and just absolutely obliterates a very bad Jacksonville team, admittedly. But I think you've got, got probably got to take the Redskins here, plus the seven, plus seven points in a division rivalry game. I think we're going to take the Redskins plus the seven. I think that's the side to take. My favorite game of the week, my play of the week. Here it is, play of the week. It's contrarian. It's the game that you're going to hold your nose at. You're going to say, there's no way in the world I want to bet or touch this game. And I understand why. The public's going to be all over the Houston Texans who are visiting and playing at the New York Giants. All over the Houston Texans. Houston Texans are minus two playing at the Giants. And this is more, maybe more of a bet against Houston uh, uh, wager. And I'll tell you why in just a second. You've got to get some more refreshment. Here's the thing with the Houston Texans. They open up at home in a perfect spot. They open up a uh, uh, very good defense. They open up at home and demolish Washington. Then they go on the road and play one of the worst teams in football at Oakland and win at Oakland. Big deal. I'm not impressed. I'm sorry. They haven't been tested yet. Houston is an untested football team. Now, going on the road for two consecutive weeks at Houston, at Oakland on the West Coast, then at New York on the East Coast, and they're laying points. This is one of those perfect, quintessential, ideal, perfect, perfect storm kind of a games where if you have any balls whatsoever, if you're any kind of a handicapper, if you have any sense of history or knowledge about handicapping, you're going to be all over the New York Jets. And anybody who bets the Houston Texans, I got no respect for you. I got, I, I don't know who, I don't even know what happens in this game. Any idiot who bets the Houston Texans is an idiot. They have no, they have no respect for me because there's no way you can back the Houston Texans in this game. Now you may not want to bet the New York Giants because that's a really, really dismal team right now on paper. Four straight preseason games, they couldn't get a first down. The first game at Detroit, they stunk. At home in the opener against Arizona, they stunk worse. And now I'm betting the New York Giants? Yeah. Because that's how you make money in football. You go against the public. You don't do what everybody else does. Shh. Don't tell anybody. Shh. That's what I'm doing. The New York Giants are the play. 
not saying they're going to, you know, I could be wrong. I, 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 I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. But anyone who doesn't see these ships sailing off to the promised land and, and, and the golden treasure, this is one of those games where everything lines up for the New York Giants. A well-coached team, Tom Coughlin, is not going to play two horrible games in a row with the New York Giants. The New York Giants will, just, will eat this team up if they go 0-3. This is a must-win. Circle the wagons. This is a 7-9 team that could have given up last year when they went 0-6 in their first six games, but somehow Coughlin comes, is able to mobilize these people and win seven games. That's amazing. And I know that they're starting out again. It looks the same, but there's no way that you can convince me that Houston should be laying points on the road in this spot. Give me the New York Giants. And give me a teaser on this team, the Wong teaser, W-O-N-G, Wong the shit out of the New York Giants, getting plus eight. Plus two, you're capturing the key numbers in NFL betting, three, four, six, and seven, that's a Wong teaser, bang, take the New York Giants plus the eight. And if you don't do it, you're missing the boat. I'm out of breath. I want no piece of that Minnesota-New Orleans game. No peace whatsoever. None. Maybe I'll play the over. Just because it's in a dome, it's not carpet. The Saints offense is gelling. The Saints can't stop anybody. Looks to be a, like a 37-31 kind of a game. I may play the over. But those the totals, I, I actually do much better in totals and sides, which I don't know why I'm doing all the prognostication on sides. That being said, I think this game may fly over the total just because of the obvious reasons. I know Edgar Peterson maybe come back to the offense, blah, blah, blah. I can just do all that. I don't want any piece of a game where I'm having to lay 10 points. Almost no situation will I ever do that in football. And it's 9.5, 10. Maybe I lean minus 9.5 with the Saints. Maybe. Saints could be 2-0 and right now. Saints could be 2-0. and They lost two very close games. They can't win on the road. But they were 8-0 at home last year. 8-0. You don't win in New Orleans. Nobody does except the Saints. Let's get to the next game. Tennessee Titans are playing at Cincinnati. How in the fuck can figure out the Tennessee Titans? Winning at Kansas City, and then they they, they, they play at home, and you think they're going to beat Dallas, or it's going to be close, and Dallas just walks in and just stomps on that team. Just stomps on the Titans. It was a disgrace. Holy shit. How can you, how can you hold your head up? How can you, like, you know, how, how do you live on? I mean, good night, Titans. They wake up. Are you serious? I don't want any peace. This is a Jekyll Hyde team I've ever saw. I have no idea what's going to happen. Who's going to show up when with the Titans? You just can't trust the team. There's certain teams you just don't even want to touch. And the Titans, in my view, are one of them, at least at this stage of things. Now, with the Cincinnati Bengals, I am tempted, tempted to take the bait, take the bait, and just and just take the, uh, lay the seven. I probably want to tease this down, though. I'll tease it from seven down to one. Wong teaser. Catch the seven. Catching the six, catching the four, catching the three. And that's what I'll probably do with the Cincinnati Bengals. A very good defense. Winning at Baltimore week one. Week number two, destroying Atlanta. Now at home for the second consecutive week. Cincinnati does not take this game lightly. They will win the game. I'm going to lay minus one on the teaser with the Bengals. If there was a coach of the year right now, I probably would vote maybe Buffalo, but... I'd probably vote for the for the, the Cleveland coach. This is a team that could be 2-0 right now, upsetting the Saints at home, almost beating the Steelers on the road. Everybody thought this team would be garbage, would be horrible. That's what everyone thought about the Cleveland Browns. And in, in, in every one of their games are exciting. They've only played two, I know. But this they look good in preseason. So, you know, Hoyer seems to, to, to be playing well. They had they lost their wideouts. They had all kinds of defensive problems, and somehow this team looks very looks very competitive. They're very exciting to watch. I, I, I'm kind of this closet Cleveland Brown, Browns fan in, in a way. Uh, I think this is a really bad spot, though, for the Browns. I just sitting there did the dance and drank the Kool-Aid on the Browns, and here we am because I'm going to bet the Ravens. And the reason is the Ravens are laying, ten, laying a point and a half, I believe, on this game, and they've had a 10-day rest. And, man, I don't like drinking the Joe Flacco Kool-Aid. I don't like doing it. This team always seems to disappoint me and burn my fucking bankroll to a fucking crisp. Just to a crisp. Every time I've been on the Ravens on the road. They just fucking rape me. They just destroy me. 
And I can't believe I'm betting the Ravens again, but I probably am going to lay the, the, uh, the minus one and a half with the Ravens. I think the Ravens just had too much lumber for this team. I think the Browns have played over their head. Give them all the credit in the world. Applause, applause, applause. I think the Ravens, though, coming off to that after that ten day rest, the Browns coming off a huge victory. I think I think the Ravens get, get a, have enough to get it done here, and they and they they probably just had too much talent for the Browns. Give me the Ravens minus the point and a half. The Green Bay Packers are playing at Detroit. And this has been a funny line because I think it opened at Green Bay was getting two and a half. I think it's one now, so it's dropped about a point, point and a half. Because quite, of course everybody's going to bet the Packers. Of course everyone is going to bet the Green Bay Packers. And by the way, I'm one of those idiots who actually thought that maybe Detroit's going to, you know, for real, idiot me, they go on the road and get their fucking asses stomped at Carolina last week. They didn't even show up. The team, Anybody on that team, the Detroit team who collects a paycheck should be fucking, like, that they should be tried it for, for for theft. That was disgraceful what the what the, the Lions did last week. But they are a different team at home. I don't really like the side so much here. I lean Lions. I'm one of the few people again leans the Detroit Lions. I think this is their arch rival. They're going to get up at home. Big game for the Lions. Can't believe I'm backing a Caldwell coached Stanford quarterback team. But I, I I believe the better play here is probably to bet the over, and that's 51. This total is 51. Points. I think they're going to throw the hell out of the ball. You're going to see both quarterbacks throw 50 times. It's going to be an aerial show. We're looking at a 38-31 kind of a game. Either way, I, I, I think the total of 50 or 51. 52, excuse me. I still like over 52. I, I go up to 54 on this. I go up to 54. I go any, over any number lower than 54. I think these teams have a historic uh, history of playing overs. I don't have numbers. I, I do this all free, you know, free form. But I, I do believe if you look back, you'll see over, 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 maybe a few unders. But you see a lot of overs, especially in Detroit, on that rubber grass that always seems to be a faster track. I hate that rubber and synthetic turf kind of stuff they play with. Which I can't stand those fields because they, all they do is promote offense. I don't, I don't like that at all. I, I like low-scoring football games. They're easier to handicap. Indianapolis Colts at Jacksonville. Here's another spot. Another spot. Just if, if, if you're st still with me, if you're still with me, listen to what I'm about to say. This is one of those things that if you have any self-respect as a handicapper, if you know anything about football, you're going to take the you're going to take the Jacksonville Jaguars in this game. And I am holding my nose and saying that, and I'm putting a blindfold on because it's hard to watch that team. Henny has looked fucking dismal, and the, the Jacksonville Jaguars look to look like a shit for 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 seven of eight quarters. They were up 17 nothing at Philadelphia week one. 17 nothing, and they haven't done shit since then. They'd they, they, they scored one touchdown, I believe, in the rest of the whole fucking uh, uh, seven quarters. And they're playing Washington and uh, Philadelphia. Those are not the best defenses in the NFL. That's disgraceful. But I think the Jacksonville Jaguars here at home, they're going to have this. This is like one of those things, again, they're 0-2. They know that to have any kind of a season that's... Any that, that has any semblance of being successful or positive, they have to be competitive in this game at least. They have to win the game, yes, but they have to be competitive. And let me say this: any time I can, any time I can fade the Indianapolis Colts or a team like that, laying a touchdown on the road. Are you kidding me? Who in the hell would bet on the Indianapolis Colts laying a touchdown against anybody? Are you serious? Who in the hell would back the Colts laying anything more than a field goal, let alone a touchdown? I realize the I realize the Jaguars are fucking awful. That's an awful team to watch. It's painful. I'm sitting there watching the team and I'm screaming at the television. I can't stand to watch any. It's 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 so horrible. It really is. But I will say this: that if you have any, if you have any knowledge about betting pro football. This is one of those games you just have to hold your nose and say, give me the value. And the value is with the Jacksonville Jaguars, plus seven. Give me the Jaguars. <sighs> Oakland Raiders at the New England Patriots. The Patriots are minus 14. Two touchdowns. I want no part of that. I will never, ever, 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 ever lay points like that. I will never lay two touchdowns in the NFL, ever, in any circumstances. I'm trying to think of an, exa of an exception. There probably is one. I can't think of it right now. I will never lay that kind of touch. I will just won't do it. I'm tempted to take it, 
but not after what I've seen from Carr. This, I, I, I don't, I don't want to get into, you know, he maybe, I, I, it's too early. He's only played two games. I don't see what I don't see what the Raiders are seeing in this quarterback. I don't know why they're not starting Schaub. Schaub at least makes them like semi-competitive. You know, there was talks about the Raiders have a pretty good rush deep, deep uh, offense. They have a fairly good defense with with some leadership at quarterback. Whatever, maybe they could be a seven and nine team. They got no shot with Carr right now. I wasn't impressed at all. Any any sports writers out there talking about? I'm seeing progress with Carr. The, uh, the, 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 this is the brother of David Carr who played at Fresno State. Well, they must be watching a diff, different different uh, screen than I'm watching because I'm not impressed at all. But I'm not going to touch this game. I may I may lean under, by the way. Oh man, this is one of those games. This is one of those perfect games that lines up for an under. This is a perfect game that lines up for the under. Why? Well, here's why. Because I'm not so sure that the Patriots take this game that seriously. I expect this is what they call a, a, a situation or a recipe for an ugly win. In other words, the Patriots do just enough to get by. They just show up and win a, I'll make up a score here, 27 to 10 game. You know, just... Maybe a really ugly game where they win 16-10. They just, they just, there's really nothing there to motivate that team to like put it all and just blow the team out. I know that happens sometimes, but there's really nothing to indicate here except that it's a home opener. Except that after two straight games on the road for the Patriots, they are now opening at home. All right, but I think this is one of those games that the Patriots just take lightly. They just want to get out of Dodge. They want to get out of there healthy. Don't want anybody banged up, and um, I, I, I won't touch the, the side, but I will probably play that under, which is 48 and a half. I stand corrected, 47 now. It's 47. I still play, probably play that game all the way down to 45. I'll go under that total, anything down above, 40, I should say, all the way up to 45. San Francisco at Arizona. Give me the Arizona Cardinals as the home dog here. Are you kidding me? They're getting two and a half. Give me the Arizona Cardinals. No one seems to have any respect for the team ever. No one has any respect for this team that won 10 or 11 games last year. They're 2-0. and oh. They beat San Diego. They beat on the, They won on the road against the New York Giants last week. They're 2-0. and oh. Nobody has any respect for them. Anytime I can fade Colin Kaepernick as a passer, I'm thrilled to do that. We saw the man, you know, basically self-destruct last week. Three interceptions, a fumble, and a 15-yard personal conduct penalty, all in a half of football. Way to go, Mr. Kaepernick. I just love watching that. That was a sweet victory for the Bears. And so I don't, I don't really, you know, San Francisco is only the, maybe the best team on paper in football. Maybe better than Seattle. I really believe that. Extraordinary offensive line. By far the best wideouts in the game. The best rushing game probably in football. And maybe the best defense and certainly one of the best coaches in the NFL. So why isn't this team like steamrolling everybody and winning, you know, going 14-2 and two every year? Well, they've been in the championship game, you know, a conference championship three straight years. I give them credit. But I just don't think there's a lot of character and the leadership of this team with Ka Kaepernick uh, under center. I'm always glad to fade him on the road when he cases any kind of adversity, any kind of pressure. He folds like a cheap suitcase, and Arizona's the perfect opponent on the road to get under his skin. And I think this is a very, very tough game for the 49ers. Boy, I wish the 49ers were 2-0 right now, because then I would just hammer the Cardinals to win outright. But now the, the 49ers are a little more... They are a little more... They're going to be focused. There's no question that they're, going to, they're not going to take this opponent lightly on the road. But everybody in the public seems to take this this, this team lightly. They, they, nobody seems to have any respect for the Cardinals. This is one of those turn-the-corner games, I think, for this franchise, this organization. And I think the Cardinals, again, they win this game and go 3-0. and You could be looking at a team that, I don't want to say wins this division, but now uh, threatens to win the division. Mark my words. Arizona wins this game. This is a team that's capable now of winning, surprisingly, the NFC West. Mark my words. Next game is Denver at Seattle, a game that nobody cares about, right? It's only the Super Bowl rematch, and I couldn't give two shits about this game, except for the total. I like the under. It's 48 and a half. This is a tough place to play in Seattle. It's a tough place for any opposing offense. It's always a tough place to play for the opposing offense. The crowd noise, the elements, whatever that situation is, it's not an easy place to, to, to score points. And I'm going to take the under. I think Seattle... Will, will, will maybe struggle themselves offensively, a very high total. It's obviously completely warped out of proportion because of 
Manning, rightfully so. Manning, you know, all the Denver games are now mid-40s and up and usually in the 50s, rightfully so. And the Super Bowl last year where they scored, you know, Seattle scored whatever, how many, 40-something points or whatever it was. So, so we understand that. But I'm going to go under on this game but because I think one of these offenses struggles, and I expect one of these defenses to play very well, probably Seattle. And I don't think they're going to go, they're going to break 48 and a half. I think that's my number. Yeah, 48 and a half. I'll go under that total. Under, under 48 and a half. And be sure and capture the 48 if you can. So bet this. You can probably bet it late because it probably climbs to 49 by game time. Public likes to bet over as light. Kansas City at Miami. I lean Kansas City. Again, another hold your nose and bet this game. Um, running, uh, running back is back for, uh, for Kansas City this week, I believe, plus four. This is a toss-up game. Uh, Andy Reid, you know, is usually a very good coach to back on the road, especially after he's lost a game. And I'm willing to take the Chiefs here because the Chiefs tend to play to their level of competition. This is not a great team. Miami's at best a 500 team, probably more of a six and ten, seven and nine kind of a team. They got all kinds of. They got some injuries. I believe the wideout is out, or uh, I don't have notes in front of me. But what, there's some concerns about an injury with uh, with Miami. Tannehill, you know, certainly doesn't impress me much. Uh, I, I don't know why Miami's laying four here. Uh, that line should be three, if three. If three, it should be. I mean, this is a vast overreaction. Uh, Kansas City played very well in the road last week. Could have won that game. You saw what happened. They were driving and could have, you know, potentially tied the, the Broncos in Denver. So the, the Chiefs, you know, it's hard to get a lot of enthusiasm for the Chiefs right now. But they're getting a little too much. They're not getting quite enough respect here. I will back the Kansas City Chiefs getting four. Key number. You've got to capture the four. Must capture the four. It's no bet. I will play the Kansas City Chiefs at four. Pittsburgh, this is a Sunday night game. Pittsburgh's playing at Carolina. Pittsburgh coming off a 10-day rest where they got dem demolished, demolished at Baltimore last week. And Carolina is surprising 2-0. Carolina winning at Tampa the first week, winning at Tampa, and then destroying, absolutely humiliating the Lions in week number two. Uh, I am going to lean on this game toward the over. Here's why. Uh, this total is only 41 and a half. It's 41 and a half. And, and, and here's what I really like. The public is not caught on. The betters, blind, whatever, nobody is caught on the fact that the Steelers are no longer an under team. This is not a team that runs the ball up the middle 45 times a game and plays great defense. That's not the Pittsburgh Steelers of 2014. That's not the Tomlin offense. That's not the way the Steelers are anymore. The Steelers are an offensive-minded, high-scoring, game-minded machine. And what I mean is they play Cleveland. That, that game five years ago would have been lined at 37 and a half. They scored 56 or whatever a few weeks ago. Baltimore and Pittsburgh 10 days ago on Thursday Night Football. I forgot the final. Didn't they score 50 in that game or something? I mean, these are high-scoring games. I think actually the Steelers uh, offense struggled in that game, as I recall. Anyway, that makes me more, even more inclined now to back the Steelers to score some points in, in Carolina. I'm still not convinced this is the great defense that the Panthers are our, our perspective. They played nobody so far. You know, they, 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 they won at Tampa Bay. Detroit, for whatever reason, didn't show up in that game. There was, they, couldn't do a sh they couldn't do a fucking thing. The Lions couldn't. And I'm, not, I'm totally not convinced the Panthers are really the 2-0 team that they uh, seem to be. I'm not taking the Steelers. I just won't do it. I, I don't like the, any, I want any part of the Steelers who are at best maybe a 500 team, but I do like the over. I think this game sails over. I think it's a 27-20 kind of a game. I think it flies over 41 and a half. This game, I easily, especially on Sunday night football, it's a night game. Night games always go over by about three or four games of points higher than average. Total NFL mean total is 42 and a half, somewhere in there, 43-ish. The average Sunday night game and Monday night particularly, those games are landing in the mid to, to high 40s all the time. I mean, you just, just go back and look, because the stars want to shine, man. The wide receivers want to make that extra yardage. They're playing in front of their peers, the excitement, the home crowd, whatever. Defensive scores. Night games go higher than average. Almost always give me the over, which is why I'm taking the Pittsburgh-Carolina game to go over the total on Sunday night, as I'm taking the Monday night football game, which is Chicago Bears at New York Jets, to go over as well. That's another over. And there's a lot of compelling reasons to like that as well. Uh, that's a 45 and a half. 
45 and a half on the Chicago and New York Jets Monday Night Football game. I like the Jets minus one. I like the Jets minus one. I also like the over 45 and a half. Here's why. The, the Chicago Bears played at San Francisco last week and lost, I think it was five or six defensive starters. I think three of them were out for, are out for this game. This is Friday night. I could be wrong on this. My game time things change. But I, the Chicago's defense was decimated by the, in that victory. Decimated. And now they're going to be, you know, the, the Jets, you know, not, not the most powerful offense, but they did score like 27 at Green Bay last week. I'm going to, I think this is a breakout game for the New York Jets, an absolute breakout game where all the dominoes line up for that team, kind of like the Atlanta Falcons we saw last night where they scored 56 unanswered points. This is a statement game for the New York Jets to say we are here, we are, have arrived. This is, this is where everything lines up for that franchise, and they're a Monday Night Football, a rare thing for them. When we saw Geno Smith playing it at, at a game at Atlanta last season, I think it was week four or five, Falcons were laying nine or ten. I forgot the number. And Geno Smith looked like he looked like Joe Namath out there. As he threw four touchdown passes. He threw for 400 yards. He, it was amazing. And there was something about that atmosphere where this team rose to the occasion. They weren't, they weren't expected to do anything, and they played extraordinarily well. I think this home team in this situation against a banged-up defense in Chicago, a banged-up team that also tends to score a lot of points, the Bears do. They wreck up a shitload of yards. And with, obviously with Hester and with Jay Cutler's throwing 45 balls a game. So we, we're seeing a spot here where, the, the, much like the Steelers, people think Pittsburgh Steelers defense, Chicago Bears defense. This is not 1986, folks. That's not the way it works anymore. These are two very offensive-minded teams, a line that's not caught on. Give me, though, the New York Jets and a statement Minus the one. Give me the Jets, and also give me the over 45 and a half. I expect the Jets, if you call out a score here, I look 31-17 kind of a game here where the Jets pull away with a victory. I'm Nolan Dalla. That's NFL week number three. We'll see how you do. We'll see how I do. Good luck, and may all your victories be uh, sweet as wine. Thank you.